Good morning. Good to see everyone here this morning. May we open our service by turning to hymn number 52. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4, standing as we sing. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, blessed be the name of the Lord, the glories of my God and King. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Jesus, the name that charms our fears. Blessed be the name of the Lord, the music in the sinner's ears. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I never shall forget that day. Blessed be the name of the Lord. When Jesus washed my sins away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Uh, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you once again for a beautiful Lord's Day and for the privilege that we have, the freedom, and the anticipation of being in your house to worship you this morning. Thank you for the friends and uh, the family that we gather together with, the family of God. And Lord, we pray your blessings upon each one here today, that your strength, your comfort, your encouragement uh, might be with each and every one. Lord, we do thank you for uh, the joys that we experience as we walk a pilgrim pathway with our Lord Jesus. Help us, Lord, to learn a little bit more each day of how best to walk that pathway. As we think back over this past week, Lord, we celebrate and we give you thanks for the joys of having this house uh, filled with little children and, and with youth and for the blessing that that was. We continue to pray for each one of them that their lives might have been touched in an internal way. And may you continue by your Holy Spirit to guide and lead and direct each one to grow in their knowledge of the Savior Jesus. Thank you for these blessings, Father. Be with us as we continue our worship, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to let you be seated for just a moment. Um, it is a little different. It's a lot quieter this morning <coughs> as, than it has been all the rest of this uh, last past week because we had this place pretty much full of uh, children and very active, uh, energetic children and some wonderful youth. Had a great week of VBS. Uh, Stacy's going to share that report with us uh, a little later. I want to introduce uh, my guests to you. You've met them already, but my middle daughter, Lori, her husband, Robin, and their daughter, Cherie. Would y'all stand? We want to just say hi to you. There they are. <laughs> Cherie's a junior at Tech now, and so we're delighted to have them. So I guess we should all greet one another. Let's do that now. Would you stand and greet, shake somebody's hand?
you make your way back to your seats, uh, just be seated for a moment if you would. As I said, this, this was a great week for our church and our community, I think, during our VBS. We had help from so many different sources. Of course, the church group from DeKalb came, but our folks stepped up. And uh, one of the greatest blessings we had was the shower trailer. And thanks to Brad, uh, who got that here from O'Donnell, set it up and manned it all through the week. Boy, did you ever get a count on how many showers we had? Lost count, probably, <clears throat> but it, I, we couldn't have got by, I don't think, without that. So thank you, Brad, for, for that. <clears throat> and, and another thing that uh, was so very necessary and very valuable uh, were the prayers that were lifted up during the week. And I know all of you were praying for our VBS. Uh, but we, uh, we want this morning to dedicate a prayer plaque that's going to go on our prayer room. And Joy Barham's son-in-law, uh, Mike Lloyd, made this. Isn't that a beautiful plaque? Wonderful job that he did. We'll put it right out there on the door beside the prayer room. And Joy was in that prayer room every morning this week. Some of the rest of you were as well. We've got a place there where you can put prayer requests and know that they will be prayed for. Uh, but this is something I think is going to be very special for us. Uh, the prayer room's been there, of course, all along, but uh, we're going to make a new focus on it and, and ask that uh, you use it from time to time. Anytime the church is open or you've got a key to get in, come in and enjoy that uh, beautiful prayer room. Sandy has decorated it very nicely for us, and we appreciate that uh, as well. And it's a, it's, a, it's a pleasant place and an inspiring place to be. So I want this morning for us to just uh, pray right now and ask God to use this prayer room in a special way uh, to bless our church, our people, and to bless us as we have communication with him through this time of prayer. And I want to ask Joy if she would just lead us in a moment of prayer. Let's all stand together, uh, shall we? And Joy, would you lead us in a prayer? Remain standing as we continue our singing. May we turn in our hymnals now to hymn number 692. Hymn 692, we'll sing verses 1, 3, and 4. Be not dismayed, whatever be tied, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. All you may need, he will provide. God will take care of you. God will take care of you, God will take care of you, through every day or all the way, He will take care of you, God will take care of you, 
No matter what may be the test, God will take care of you. Lean weary one upon his breast, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. God will take care of you. God will take care of you. And then may we turn to hymn number 563. <coughs> number 563, we'll sing all the verses. <coughs> <coughs> Open my eyes that I may see Glimpses of truth thou hast for me Place in my hands the wonderful key That shall unclasp and set me free Silently now I wait for thee Ready, my God, thy will to see Open my eyes, illumine me Spirit divine, open my ears that I may hear voices of truth thou sendest clear. And while the wave knows fall on my ear, everything false will disappear. Silently now I wait for thee, ready my God thy will to see. Open my ears and illumine me, Spirit divine. Open my mouth and let me bear, Gladly what warm truth everywhere. Open my heart and let me prepare, Love with thy children thus to share. Silently now I wait for thee, Ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my heart, feeling in me. Spirit divine. All right, you may be seated. Sandy's going to come. Brother Gene asked me a couple weeks ago if I would bring the scripture this morning, and my favorite scripture is an easy one for me. Uh, it became special to me when I was in high school, and I read a book by Johnny Erickson Tata, and she was a young woman who had uh, been paralyzed in a diving accident, and she had written a story about how God had helped her through that, and one of my favorite scriptures came from that book. And then this morning, I was in the church office, and I uh, saw that she is on the cover of Mature Living. And then they also have another um, article that's about my favorite scripture. So y'all might want to pick that up and look at it. But it comes from Isaiah <clears throat> chapter 40, verses 28 through 31. Do you not know, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for all the blessings that you've given us and the fact that we have the ability to come into your house and worship with you every Sunday morning. Lord, I ask that you will help us that when we do grow weary, that we turn to you and remember that you are the strength that can help us through any problem that we have. Again, Lord, we thank you for all the many blessings you've given us. We ask that you'll forgive us where we fail you. For this we pray in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. All right. So... We had Vacation Bible School this week, and it was a success. We had 74 uh, children from the ages of 3 all the way up to uh, 12th grade. Uh, so 74 that we ministered to. Our biggest classes were our youth class that we had, 
and then our second and third grade class. And they had us on our toes, so we'll say that. <laughs> um, we took an offering this week and it went to Shoes for Orphan Souls. It's kind of a department branch of Buckner's. It's just uh, through them and we raised $186.75 and that money will go to provide shoes in Texas uh, for children who are in need. Um, and so we were really blessed to have the DCAB people come and help us this week. And I wanna say a big thank you to all of our workers that were from here. Uh, we wouldn't have been able to do it without you. And so I really appreciate each one of y'all that helped out this week in whatever way that y'all helped. All right, well, thank y'all. All right, may we take our hymnals once again and turn to hymn number 607. Number 607, we'll sing all the verses. <laughs> Thou my everlasting portion, more than friend or life to me. All along my pilgrim journey, send me, let me walk with thee. Close to thee, close to thee, close to thee, close to thee. All along my pilgrim journey, Savior, let me walk with thee. Not for ease or worldly pleasure, not for fame my prayer shall be. Gladly will I toil and suffer, only let me walk with thee. Close to thee, close to thee, close to thee, close to thee. Gladly will I toil and suffer, only let me walk with thee. Lead me through the veil of shadows, bear me o'er life's fitful sea. Then the gate of life eternal, may I enter, Lord, with thee. Close to thee, close to thee, close to thee, close to thee. And the gate of life eternal, may I enter. To Lord with
two verbs built two empires, said Augustine in the fourth century. The verbs were to have and to be. The first empire, to have, of course, was an empire of things, material things, power, persuasion, authority, possessions. The second empire, to be, was a spiritual kind of empire based on things that people can become. When you think about the history of our nation, you realize that uh, it was in the beginning primarily built on the basis of the to be verb. Our early forefathers, especially at least those who landed at Plymouth, they wanted to be something. They wanted to be free. They wanted to be able to worship God as they chose according to how the Holy Spirit directed their conscience. That's the way it was in the beginning. The founders of our uh, nation and the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, they emphasized that God created all men equal and that we have the inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But as you well know, our country has changed a great deal over the years, and I would say we're probably a nation built on the verb to have in these days because possessions are so important. That's why everybody in the world wants to come to America. They want to have what we have. Uh, we have more material possessions, perhaps, than any other nation in the world. But still, we hunger and thirst for something which is beyond the material. You can pretty much describe a nation, you know, in these days in terms of what it hungers and thirsts for. Literally speaking, there are so many nations in the third world that really hunger for bread or for sustaining food to keep body and soul together. There are so many nations that thirst for clean water, water that's pure, water uh, to drink. But this morning we're talking about a different kind of hunger and thirst. And in the fourth beatitude, Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, Jesus said these words, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they are the ones who shall be filled. Well, we know that hunger and thirst are two of the most basic desires of human nature. Uh, they have to be satisfied for life to go on. But uh, we're talking today about a different kind of hunger and a different kind of thirst. And Jesus said, this is something which can be satisfied. Those who hunger and thirst in this kind of way can be satisfied. They can be blessed. They can be filled. But um, if you want this kind of blessing in your life, it's something that you have to focus on with an understanding of what it means to truly hunger and thirst for righteousness. So that's what we want to look at in this fourth of the eight Beatitudes today, these words of our Lord himself. So I wonder, uh, you might ask yourself this morning, do you have that kind of desire in your heart? Are you really hungry? Are you really thirsty for the spiritual things that Jesus spoke of, in particular for righteousness? Let's look at some things that Jesus uh, would have included in our understanding about this. The first of these would be the object of our desire. It must become apparent pretty quickly that if you, what, if you truly, really desire is happiness in this life, if you, like so many Americans, I think, believe that your inalienable right is to be happy, then as you seek happiness, what oftentimes happens is you miss it altogether, if that's the object of your desire. So what Jesus was saying here is that the object of your desire is need, needs to be righteousness. He said, uh, <clears throat> seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and then these things will be added unto you. So there is a way to blessedness, there is a way to true happiness, but it's when we focus our desire on the right thing. Jesus said the right thing is 
righteousness. Seek that first. But, so we might ask the question, well, how does one do that? Or what does it really mean to desire, to hunger and thirst for righteousness? How do you define that? Or how do you understand that? Martin Lloyd-Jones, that I've spoken of so many times in regard to these uh, Beatitudes, who was for so many years pastor of Westminster Chapel in London and a great writer and theologian, he says this, simply put, <clears throat> it means to desire what is right. Okay, so who's going to say what's right? And somebody says, well, what's good is what's right. So then the philosopher is going to ask, well, who defines what's good? Because what's good for you might not be good for me. Or as it seems to be so often in our country in these days, public opinion defines what is right and what is good. But you and I know that not even majority public opinion can define for you and me what is right because public opinion can be wrong. So for us, for the Christian, it obviously comes down to one thing and one place where you find and define what is good and what is right, and that is God is good and God is right. Period. And here's where you discover God, and here, here is his word to us about the rules of living and how we can define what is good and what is right. And the problem we have, and this is something we talked about in Vacation Bible School this week among, with the kids quite often. They even had a little song about it. Uh, sin messed everything up. A uh, cute little song, but that's the truth, you know. Uh, God is good and God is right, but we are not. We are not God and we're not by nature good and we're not by nature right. We choose so oftentimes the wrong. So there's our problem. We are sinners and, uh, and that's, uh, that's where the difference comes in. So what can we do about that? But the truth is, even sinners can seek that which is good and right. And that's why Jesus said, the blessing comes to those who desire, who have that inner compulsion, the need and the desire to seek righteousness and what is good. Billy Graham says this, you were made for God's fellowship. And nothing else will ever satisfy you. So, so many of our people in, in our nation, around the world, I suppose, they have so many things, but they don't have the one thing that truly satisfies and brings peace. A number of years ago, in, uh, in a church that I pastored, I had a, a man in my church who was very active in prison ministry. And every week he would go to the prison and he'd preach to the inmates. He told me this story uh, one time after he'd been there that um, after the service, a man came up to him and he knew this man to be an avowed Satan worshiper. So this man came to him and he said to him, I have been lied to. And my friend said, what do you mean? He said, well, I was told that if I worshiped Satan, that I would have things and I would have what, what life offers, and, and I have good things, and, and everything would be good and great. And he said, but look at me, I'm a prisoner. My life is miserable. Uh, I don't have anything that's good. So somebody lied to me. But he said, you know, I look around and I see some of my fellow inmates who are also prisoners, and yet they seem to be happy. They have a peace, they have a contentedness, and, and there are all these Christians. He said, I want what they've got. So that's the thing. That's the desire, you see, for that which only Christ can bring into our lives and can only give to us. So number one, this blessedness that comes with those who desire righteousness is, first of all, that they have the right object. The desire is for not just happiness, not just things, but the desire is for being right with God. That's the first thing. The second thing I think we need to focus on is that there, there is in the language that's used here an intensity 
of desire. So we know, you know very little about what it really means to be hungry or to be thirsty. We miss a meal now and then and, and so we can be a little bit hungry or we work out in the hot sun and we can be a little bit thirsty. That's actually not the kind of wording that is used here. We're talking about here something that is very, very intense. The wording suggests somebody who is actually starving to death or somebody who is dying of thirst. It's, it's that kind of desire, that kind of hunger that is suggested by the words that are used here. We need to understand that. This is not just the average uh, uh, ordinary, well, I, I wish things would be a little better or I'd like to like to get to know the Lord a little better, but this is an intense kind of longing and in, <clears throat> an intense kind of desire. The word also suggests something else here. Uh, you know, we would say sometimes, well, I'm, I'm hungry, I'd like a piece of bread, a piece of toast or something. <clears throat> or, or we might say, boy, I'm thirsty, I sure would like a drink of water. That's not, again, the kind of expression that's used here. What it's saying is, I'm hungry enough to eat a horse. I mean, literally, we're talking about somebody that wants the whole loaf of bread or would devour a meal. It's that kind of hunger that is expressed here. The thirst is somebody who would say, well, I'm going to drink the well dry or I drink the whole pitcher, not just a glass full. It's the intensity of desire that is spoken of here. It's when you truly get serious about how deeply you desire this. It's like the psalmist uh, when he had sinned uh, against God and, and his whole being, he said, was just torn apart. His bones, in his very bones, he felt uh, the guilt of his sin. And so he, he wrote these words in Psalm 42. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. You see, for this kind of person, just a Sunday morning religion is not enough. This person wants to go deeper. This person wants to walk with God and wants to have the Holy Spirit filling his life so that he experiences the reality of the fellowship with God moment by moment, day by day, uh, morning, noon, and evening. This is the kind of person who will not be satisfied with anything less than all that Jesus has to give to him. Jesus said, blessed is that kind of person, for he shall be filled. So that's the other thing we look at here, the satisfaction of this desire. This is the blessedness as each one of these beatitudes it begins in that kind of way. Blessed. Well, how are they blessed? Well, because for that kind of person who has that deep, intense longing and desire to be right with God, that hunger shall be satisfied, that thirst shall be satisfied as well. We have the certainty of Jesus' promise that it will be so. So here's an interesting thing comment about this and it, it, it applies to our neighborhood perhaps better than maybe almost any and especially you guys that feed cattle. Uh, you'll find this interesting. The word filled here, um, for they will be filled, this is the word, the exact word that was used for fattening a steer or a heifer in the pen, feeding the cattle. And you know what, uh, what that's like, some of you guys. You know, you don't ever want those cattle to go hungry, do you? Uh, not a day that they don't get all the food that they need. You want them to eat and eat and eat and eat because the whole point is they're going to grow and get fat uh, so you can sell them. But that's the word that is used here. Here's a person who's not going to get by on just a, a slim little bite and a little tidbit here and there. Here's the person who desires everything that God has to offer. And Jesus said, according to that desire, you will be filled and fattened and filled to the overflowing. So there, there is the way, Jesus said, of blessedness for this kind of individual. But, you know, we ask the question, how does one 
cultivate that inner desire? How, how can you create that desire when it's not there? Because I think all of us look in the spiritual mirror sometimes and, and we see a dullness and a lethargy and, uh, and we find that, that there's not that hunger and that thirst. Let me just suggest two or three things about that. Number one is you don't do the things that dull your spiritual appetite. You know how it is. This is what moms have done all their lives. The kid comes right before lunch, says, can I have a cookie? Or can I have some candy? And you say, no, you can't. It's going to spoil your appetite, right? You just say that because literally that's true. You can fill yourself with all of the sweets, you know, and, and then you don't want the meats or the vegetables. Uh, you a whole lot rather prefer some of the other things, and kids uh, quite naturally go that. That's why they need some direction, and, and parents have to provide that. The same thing is true uh, for all of us. I mean, we can fill our minds and our thoughts and our, our attitudes with things that the world offers, and some of those are so appealing. Uh, but that's where advertising comes in. You know, you show people what's appealing, uh, youthfulness and all of that and so they are attracted to it and that they go out and buy that or we we can fill our minds with things like that and so it requires some discipline if you're going to have the right kind of desire that's just a natural sort of thing another thing is that um, you have to train yourself in this respect Paul said to the young man Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, train yourself to be godly. And then he goes on to say, well, a, a physical exercise is some value. Yes, it can strengthen the body and to give you better endurance and, and you'll be healthier, but that's for a limited period of time. You're going to die anyway. You can die very healthy at 99 or very healthy at 105. But spiritual exercise, Paul said to Timothy, is for an eternal benefit. And so if you want to cultivate that desire to walk with God, then you have to train yourself. You have to go through a little bit of maybe hardship, no pain, no gain. So you, you, you spend that extra bit of time in prayer or you, uh, you'll do those kind of things that help to nurture that desire within you. Then the last thing I think perhaps is a good suggestion as well is that you start with the simpler things and you work up from there. Uh, what was it that Peter said, 1 Peter chapter 2? He says this, Rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. The psalmist said that as well. Taste the Lord because he is good. Well, all of you have done that. You know how good the Lord is. You've tasted of that. But, you know, at this point in our lives, we ought to be a little beyond just the milk of the word. As Paul said, I'd like to tell you a little bit more. I'd like to delve into the riches of the meat of the word. So we start with the basic things, but we begin to expand and, and hopefully we, we work ourselves up into a deeper and richer spiritual relationship with the Lord. Well, that might mean, you know, that you focus a little bit more on prayer. It becomes not just the prayer at the meal time, but you actually set aside a little bit of time, an hour here or there. And you get alone with God and you spend that time with the Lord. And, and you don't just uh, read the, the devotional verse for the day, but you take God's word and you, you actually read more of it in a chapter or, or, or a couple of chapters. Or you set as a goal to read through the whole of God's word in a year's time. And so you begin to take steps. And then one day maybe God says to you, Come apart with me for a little while. Let's spend two or three hours in a, in a devotional meditation time. Let's have a half day 
of prayer. You ever done that in your whole life? You know, you'd be surprised at the things God can say to you when you get quiet enough and, and he gets your attention and you begin to, to go deeper with God and then all of a sudden uh, the Holy Spirit begins to say things to you and begins to reveal things to you. And so you do that. Or you go, boy, you really get uh, uh, kind of crazy here and you, you skip a meal one day and you fast. Jesus spoke often about prayer and fasting. said some things don't happen apart from prayer and fasting. So ever tried that? Ever done that? It'd be worth a, you know, a try sometime uh, to fast for a meal or for a day and then uh, use that time to grow closer to the Lord. So you start small and you, get, you grow. You continue to develop. And as that happens, your desire begins to grow. God, I want more. I want more than I've got. I want more of you. I want to understand more of your word. I want to walk more closely with you. And so it, it just works that kind of way. Blessed is the man, the Psalms begins, who, who does not sit and stand and, and walk in the, in the ways of the ungodly, but whose uh, meditation is upon the word of the Lord and whose delight is in the law of the Lord. So as you begin to take in that kind of diet, how it feeds the soul and the, and the spirit, and you find uh, yourself always uh, in that special intimate relationship with Jesus Christ wherein there is peace. And there is righteousness. And you find that those things you really, really desire begin to change the object until it focuses more and more on Jesus and then the other things come into play as well. My peace I leave with you, Jesus said. My peace I give unto you. Or my joy will be in you. The love that I have for you will be in you as the Holy Spirit pours that love out and it flows through you to others. There is a way for us to be more than we are. Jesus said it in the simple words, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they are the ones who will be filled. Let's pray together. Lord, forgive us that we aren't very often hungry we aren't very often thirsty for the true spiritual things and for righteousness because we find our appetites so often filled and satisfied with lesser things, things that the world makes so appealing. And so we dull our appetite. We lose our desire for the greater good. God, forgive us, and, and Lord, work in our hearts to create that appetite for the things of God. We want to be right with you, Lord. We want your righteousness. We want to be filled with that which only can satisfy the soul and the mind and the spirit that is focused on the Lord. So, Father, teach us that we might train ourselves to be godly, as Paul said to Timothy. Help us to put forth the effort, to make the extra effort, to take the extra steps, Lord, to, until there is created within us the desire that only you can fill by your presence, by your peace, by your spirit. So we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So Merton's going to come and lead us in our hymn. It's 500.